On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Brian G, Mr. Curtis Franklin back on the show today. Now, cyber attacks are no joke, but you can still have fun preparing for them, right? Well, that's what tabletop exercise is all about. If you want to be a cyber ninja, you got to practice your moves on that virtual dojo. If you want to make your IoT devices more secure and reliable, don't miss our guest from Keegan's. He's CEO, Vincent Cristanier, and he will share some tips and tricks and teach us how to make IoT devices more secure and more trustworthy. You definitely shouldn't miss it. Twy it on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Twyatt, This Week Enterprise Tech, Episode 538, recorded April 7th, 2023, Paving the Mobile Security Potholes. This episode of This Week Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Decisions. Don't let complexity block your company's growth. Decisions no-code rules-driven process automation software provides every tool needed to build custom workflows, empowering you to modernize legacy systems, ensure regulatory compliance, and renew the customer experience. Visit decisions.com slash twit to learn how automating anything can change everything. And by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that drastically increases your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. And by ZipRecruiter. Did you know that hiring can take up to 11 weeks on average? Do you have that time to wait? Of course not. Stop waiting and start using ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter helps you find qualified candidates for all of your roles fast. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyatt. Welcome to Twyatt, this week in enterprise tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresca, your guide through the big world of the enterprise. But I can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals and the experts out of their very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's principal analyst at Omdia, and he's the man that eats and sleeps the enterprise and seems to be eating and sleeping conferences as well. Is that right, Curtis? Uh, three conferences in a week. Is that right? You know, last, last week I had the great experience of doing three conferences in seven days, something that I really don't recommend, uh, as a general way of, of living, but I did get to see a lot of, a lot of interesting folks, a lot of interesting companies. I was first at enterprise connect where we spent a lot of time talking with companies that are doing collaboration and communications, things like that. Then uh, a total of five days at Megacon, uh, four of them while the, the con was open. That's the largest fan conference, uh, fan con in the nation. Uh, the number, the preliminary numbers that I've heard were 160,000 for that one. Um, and then uh, just a couple of days ago, I went over Fortinet was doing their annual get together uh, at Disney World and got to spend some time with folks at Fortinet. Uh, you know, the the company specific conferences, I don't do as many of, but they can be really interesting to get a glimpse at what a company is doing, what their partners are doing, and to talk to their resellers and their customers. So uh, when I have a chance to do that, I enjoy it. Uh, and on all of those, the fact that I could do them while sleeping in my own bed was a great thing. So uh, I've got that. Now I'm uh, getting ready, filling out my dance card for RSA, uh, which comes up in uh, about three weeks. And where I don't get to sleep in my own bed, but do in get to enjoy the hospitality of the city by the bay. So looking forward to that one. Looking forward to that one as well. Well, speaking of looking forward to I'm looking forward to having Mr. Brian Chi on the show. He's back. He's my friend. He's also survived Megacon. And that's right, Chibert, uh, you survived Megacon. And there's another one coming up pretty soon for you as well, right? Um, I wouldn't call it pretty soon. I'm starting to lay out plans to attend Infocom, which is off in June, so a ways away. Um, but I'm lining up old friends, acquaintances. Uh, I'm especially playing around with bright sign digital signage. 
Um, there's a lot of digital signage offerings in the market. I actually used to use Google and then the Google killed the digital signage product, which is kind of a drag. Um, but that's all right. You know, things change. But I will say being able to run an eight monitor video wall digital signage with a device that's in the $1,800 range instead of the quarter million dollar range is uh, pretty nice. Impressive. It's impressive. Well, speaking of impressive, it's been an impressive week in the enterprise. Cyber attacks are no joke, but you can still have some fun preparing for them with tabletop exercises. Now, if you want to be a cyber ninja, you need to practice your moves on the virtual dojo and tabletop exercises may be where it's at. If you want to make your IoT devices more secure and reliable, you don't want to miss our guest from Keegan, CEO of Vincent Cristania. He will take, give you some tips and tricks on how to make your IoT devices trustworthy and secure. So you definitely shouldn't miss all of that. So stick around. But before we do, we'll go ahead and jump into this week's news blips. The cloud computing arena is built around two large players with growing contenders spying around them. Now, in the UK, it's no different. Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Cloud together control around 60 to 70 percent of the UK cloud market. According to this Ars Technica article, the UK Office of Communication is a bit concerned with business practices of the dominant cloud companies. So the tech companies are already the targets of competition watchdogs in the US, UK, EU on multiple fronts. Ofcom may concern, really kind of concern here, and feels if unchecked, the concentration of cloud computing supply in the hands of a small number of large U.S. companies could lead to British consumers and customers paying more and smaller groups being squeezed out of the market. Now, Google is the U.K.'s third largest provider of cloud services with a share of between 5 to 10%. And as, as part of this concern, several investigations have been fired up. In some cases, their preliminary findings, they actually found that cloud companies are making it difficult for customers to switch cloud providers, like the cloud lock-in we've talked about before, or even allow their services to interoperate with each other on cloud groups. Now, they feel that high barriers to switching are already harming competition. Now, the truth is, no matter where you go in a cloud service industry, cloud lock-in is really inevitable in the function as a platform, function as a service and platform as a service industry. Organizations should always be looking for ways to architect their services and systems in a way to essentially encapsulate the way, a way the differences of the cloud services that are out there to maybe have minimal investment when you're switching. But organizations can also take advantage of the managed migrations and solution services out there to help people provide that ease of in transition. Now, it's true. Cloud lock-in is a big reason to think about the future, but sometimes it also means stability and guarantee for small organizations. So competition is a good thing. I believe that. So ensuring that small services have just as much an advantage in, as, as the big players is definitely important. It provides more room in the industry for them. But I'm sure not, I'm not actually really sure if forcing them is the best way to go. Well, just in case you were feeling good about cybersecurity this week, we have a story that should give you yet another reason to panic. In a blog post published April 3rd and reported on Dark Reading, Ken Tindall, the CTO of Canis Automotive Labs, described how the attackers manipulated an electronic control unit, or ECU, in a Toyota RAV4's headlight to gain access to its CAN bus. That's the principal control bus in a car through which they were able to ultimately steal the entire vehicle. The key is the control area network, that's the CAN bus. That's the IoT protocol through which the devices and microcontrollers in a vehicle communicate with one another. Now, once the criminals got in through the headlight, they hacked their way into that CAN bus, which is responsible for functions like the parking brakes, headlights, and smart key through a gateway and then into the powertrain panel. If the name didn't give you a clue, that's where the engine control lives. And this was not just a theoretical proof of concept. It's a genuine exploit. Last year, an automotive engineer in London had his Toyota RAV4 stolen using precisely this pathway. Now, the engineer had noted that someone had been messing around with his headlight for a couple of nights before the theft occurred. And then he woke up to find that the vehicle was gone. Now, when it was recovered, the theft mechanism was confirmed. This isn't the first time thieves have used one network or part of a network in a vehicle to take control of the entire thing. And just because it keeps happening, 
it doesn't mean it's inevitable. You know, it might be time for our colleagues over in the automotive industry to pick up on some of the concepts that are taking off in the world of IT. A solid dose of micro-segmentation with a nice zero-trust chaser could do wonders for the likelihood of a car staying in the owner's driveway overnight. Now, this dark reading article, I actually had to read the headlines a couple of times because it, it kind of made me go, hmm, romance scams. Authorities claw back funds from six crypto accounts they say were linked to a, quote, pig butchering cyber crime ring. That kind of made me scratch my head. Anyway, the article goes, the DOJ said in a statement that in total, it sees more than $112 million in cryptocurrency that was being laundered through the accounts. Quote, transnational criminal organizations are combining confidence scams with technological savvy to swindle Americans out of their hard-earned funds, according to Assistant Attorney General Kenneth a. Polite Jr. of the Justice Department Criminal Division said about the seizure, well, now that we have seized this virtual currency, we will seek to swiftly return it to the victims. They added, in addition to our tireless efforts to disrupt these schemes, we must also work to raise public awareness and help inform potential victims. Be wary of people you meet online. Seriously question investment advice, especially about cryptocurrency, from people you have not met in person. And remember, investments that seem too good to be true usually are. Well, while it's certainly not the only big scam in progress, it's nice to get some good news about the good guys winning this time. Again, just keep in mind, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. EU is about to say chip, chip, hooray to a 43 billion euro scheme to boost the semiconductor game and catch up with the big boys in the U.S. and Asia. According to this article from Reuters, the, chip, the CHIPS Act, which was cooked up by the European Commission last year, aims to make the EU less dependent on foreign chips after a global shortage left many European businesses in a crunch. From car makers to manufacturers, everyone wants a piece of the chip pie. Now, the EU hopes to double its slice of the global chip market to 20% by 2023. Now, the plan is expected to get the thumbs up from the EU countries and lawmakers on April 18th. However, the question still remains for me. Is it soon enough? A modern car company can easily contain more than 3,000 microchips. These could be brake controls, door bag, doors, airbags, wind, windscreen wipers. They can even be a support functions like driver assistance and navigation control. Now, chipsets are like golden screws. They grow, the growing need for chips in more and more sophisticated vehicles and features has meant that car companies are needing to remove features to actually reduce the cost. The BMW actually did away with parking assistance and even touchscreen capabilities in various models. It also withdrew semi-autonomous driving functionality from the X3, its top selling model. And Mercedes actually eliminated features such as high-end audio and wireless phone charging from several vehicles. Now, to me, it's fairly clear car makers must cultivate in-house expertise in this area rather than relying on suppliers or their sub-suppliers for semiconductors. They need to directly engage the chip makers and do the relevant designs in-house. That's Unless, unless they want to continue watching their profits fall as consumers wait and hold back their money until they feel they're getting the better deal. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we have to thank a really great sponsor of this week at Enterprise Tech, and that's Decisions. Decisions gives IT and business experts the tools to automate anything in your company, all within one no-code platform. Decisions is proven to fix any business process and prepare you to withstand economic uncertainty. We know we want to do that. Recession resilience requires a deliberate management of resources and the flexibility to adapt at a moment's notice. And the decisions no code environment makes it easy for your team to collaborate, to build and adjust workflows, dynamic forms and decision processes that fit your unique and ever changing business needs. So this is especially important today's IT talent shortage. We all know that's happening. Decisions, processes, automation software is a complete toolkit that allows developers and business users alike to build applications and automations with no code 
require. Now, their no-code platform is powerful and includes robust rules and workflow engines and a host of pre-built integrations that connect to any legacy system via API or all within a simple drag and drop visual interface. It can be deployed on-prem or even in the cloud. Companies were caught flat-footed at the onset of the pandemic, but decisions customers were fully equipped to respond. And one of the country's largest private banks built an entire PPP loan application process for small businesses affected by COVID-19 in just two days. They were the first market issuing $1 billion in loans before their competitors even started. Decisions let you customize workflows to automate the small decisions, producing faster results with even greater accuracy, allowing your team to focus on the important decisions. Now, scale your business to a better serve your customers while reducing operational costs and saving your team valuable time. Now, here's one great example of how decisions automation software can really help. Otis Elevators, you all know them, right? Otis Elevators implemented decisions to run daily pulse checks across their 2 million units operating globally. Now, by finding potential problems before they occur, they were avoiding downtime and managing their service technicians efficiently. And if you happen to be riding on an Otis Elevator, you can rest assured you'll arrive safely to your destination. As a recession approaches, the durability of businesses' foundation will directly impact its performance ability to survive. How strong is your foundation? Decisions Automation Platform provides the solution to any business challenge, automating anything and changing everything to improve your company's speed to market, financial growth, and operational success. They help industry leaders alleviate bottlenecks and automate pain points in their business so you can do what you do best and change the world. To learn more about Decisions No Code Automation Platform and scope your free proof of concept, Visit decisions.com slash twit. That's decisions.com slash twit. And we thank Decisions, their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, it's time for the bites. Now, some of the best learnings is really job on the job training. I believe that. Now, placing people in situations where they have to really critically think and solve problems in the fast lane is really helps people become more experienced and more, more skilled. In fact, there's a Feynman technique out there that basically includes the learning steps to how you learn things. And it includes this, this process of ensuring that you can go dig deep into practical solution situations and explain those learnings to somebody else. Well, tabletop ex exercises are a way for organizations to help infuse this type of learning into job training to help cybersecurity and IT pros develop better skills and combat cyber attacks much better. Now, they're interactive simulations and they're often done in teams and used to help improve an organization's overall security posture. Now, this article from Dark Reading actually outlines the steps that they should be taking to help maximize the effectiveness of tabletop exercises. Now, let's dig right in and give you the list. Now, it includes designing exercises that are tailored to the organization's specific needs. So customized exercises. That makes sense. It also means identifying the types of roles and scenarios that need to be included in that exercise and ensuring you to develop a clear and detailed exercise plan and that you're regularly evaluating or auditing after the fact, maybe post-mortaring the outcome of the exercises. So this, these all make sense to have a really good process. In fact, it kind of calls out some key technical points and data points, such as the fact that tabletop exercises can help organizations recognize potential weaknesses in their security systems, as well as improve the ability to respond quickly and effectively to possible security threats. Now, this sounds pretty interesting because, Chibert, I want to throw this to you because this this concept isn't new, right? No, we we it was called sand table exercises, and from what I understand, talking to some of the old timers in uh, my military world, uh, this goes back. Some someone said there was actually a documentation of a sand table exercise going back to the war in the Crimea. Um, so it's not, it's not new, but what we need to do is we need to go and take some of the, you know, playbook pages from our ancestors and say, Hey, let's go and create simulations. That's, that's what a tabletop is. Create a simulation and have people playing different roles. My biggest suggestion is make sure you have both a red team and a blue team. Um, there's nothing quite like having someone attempting to simulate a bad guy to help you figure out what paths they might take into your um, 
organization. So there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, it's definitely played at DEF CON. Um, in some ways, it's also played at places like Black Hat. It's been around and it works. Um, there's nothing quite like having, especially time, time limits. Um, make sure your timing is realistic. If someone takes, you know, six hours to go and do a response that in real life is supposed to take maybe 30 seconds, that's not very realistic. Um, get your people that actually think with the devious minds make the best red, red team. And uh, I, I got to admit, I really enjoyed playing red team um, in a lot of these um, cyber warrior exercises that I got to um, participate in. And um, there's this one particular kernel that says, I don't want you on a red team anymore. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. I can tell you, they're definitely fun. I get uh, even being a bystander of the process. I've watched other organizations do this before and it's pretty interesting to watch. So I, I really enjoy the whole process. And it's definitely a learning experience for even people who are like onset watching. Now in the industry of experts, we find ourselves developing, I guess you could say standard operating procedures. And sometimes we build guides on how to handle situations uh, in, the, in the case of issues going on, whether it's services or security. Now, in fact, my team does this every month and we update our guides on how to manage things when, in the case of an incident happens. Now, Curtis, I want to talk to you about this because in the industry, how are these types of processes and exercises different for the security world? Well, in the security world, again, like Brian said, you tend to have a red team and a blue team. And what they are especially good at is helping to develop scenarios that the blue team had never considered. You know, I, I preach all the time that the most significant failure in cybersecurity is the failure of imagination. The, we never imagined someone would want to do X to attack us. Um, and a good tabletop exercise can help illuminate some of those holes. Uh, I got to participate in a couple of uh, tabletop exercises, uh, both at last year's DEF CON and prior to the uh, 2020 elections, um, where there were a number of things that people were worried about. And the, the red team that I was an observer on um, came up with some ways to disrupt elections that I had not heard anyone discussing at all. Um, let's just say that there are some known vulnerabilities in the way that the U.S. postal system works that could have been exploited to essentially launch a, what amounted to a DDoS attack against mail-in ballots. Uh, there are vulnerabilities in traffic control systems that could have disrupted in-person voting. And those were the sort of things that many of the people who had focused on vulnerabilities in voting machines themselves tended to overlook. And so I think that this illumination of unforeseen threats, unforeseen vulnerabilities is one of the big advantages that comes from a tabletop exercise. The other one, frankly, is figuring out what is documented in a response team, the playbook versus what is assumed. Oh, we just know that everyone will fail over to their cell phones. Um, no, we don't know that. That needs to be documented and rehearsed if it's going to be part of a response plan. Uh, so, so things like that, they're, they're really wonderful um, tools that can be used to make a response more robust. And that's really what we're trying to get to so that where we have a good, solid, robust response when an actual exploit takes place and an attack is underway. 
Speaking of tools in the toolbox, I know a lot of organizations, they tend to kind of combine this with other techniques. I know, for instance, some organizations, they do hackathons. I know Microsoft does these where we not only build new things and exciting things, but also we go in and try to, you know, poke at things that have been around for a while, whether it's old Windows services or or whatnot, to try to make sure that we find, potentially find issues and then go and fix them or at least provide insights and visibility into those issues so we can go fix them quickly before they're found exteriorly. Um, uh, across the internet. I think this is an interesting way as well. How how well does this kind of blend you guys think with the whole red blue team scenario? Does this is something that they that all organizations should be doing on top of tabletop or is it something else that it's maybe just not as effective and they should just focus on tabletop? Actually, one of the things I, I want to toss in is um, one of my favorite tricks during tabletop exercises is I used to have a um, pad of sticky notes. And I'd randomly go to either the red team or the blue team, and I'd slap it on a person's um, chest or whatever, and it simply said, bang. And the idea was, if you don't have a backup and you got hit by a Mack truck or something like that or something nefarious happened, is your team going to be able to recover? Um in one exercise that I proposed for the um, U.S. military in the Pacific was I actually wanted to simulate a uh, nuclear blast taking out an entire base. And I used to go and say, okay, I would actually, during the exercise, physically pull the WAN interface for the entire base and say, you've just been nuked. How do you recover? So sand table exercises aren't as bogus or anything. You know, every, you know, the chat room was basically say, yes, Colonel Mustard in the library with candlestick. That's actually not far away from the truth. Um, I used to have a name tent at exercises that said Colonel Mustard and um, <laughs> it was just a distraction. Right. But as more reality you can inject into the exercise, the better you'll be able to respond when someone does decide to do something nefarious to you. And, you know, I think it's important as well. And I think Brian would agree that this is something that happens. Tabletop exercises are relatively cost effective to run. You don't have a lot of equipment. Uh, in, in general, your uh, participants can, can stay where they are. You know, today they can participate via, you know, whatever collaboration and communication system you want to use. But their predecessor to other things uh, in the first responder world, you call them sets, simulated emergency tests, where you do bring everyone in. That's where you start to bring in the actual physical response. So when you roll equipment, does the equipment show up with everything it's going to need? Do you, you know, you will have simulated victims. How do you handle a mass casualty event? In IT, we tend to use cyber ranges to do that, where uh, we will have a range with actual hardware and software set up, an entire environment. We'll have an attack on it and see how the team is going to respond and recover that system that mirrors what they have uh, in their environment. So those are more expensive, but if you do the tabletops ahead and you're prepared, it makes it much more likely that you're going to get a realistic result from your more real actionable exercises. And that's what you really need to do a couple of times a year to make sure that everyone doesn't panic, knows their role, knows what they're going to be doing when things really do go go pear shape in in a dramatic fashion. Now, I I would say that the interesting thing about tabletop exercise again they, they sound like the whole process of making them useful mean that you you have to do some things within the process to make sure that the outcome of them provide you with the necessary information that you could use to go back and make the, the adjustments or make sure people are trained in the right thing. Is there some suggestions you guys have when, it, when you're running these things that you, you can guarantee that the outcome is people are learning and, and ensuring that they have the right understanding of where they need to go next? 
don't know. I, I think used, th I, I used go to ahead, have prizes. Brian. I used to have, pri I'd throw bags of stuff at the people when they come up with something particularly clever. Um, very small, you know, might be a, you know, Starbucks card or something like that, or a Pete's coffee card. Um, just something to get them to pay attention and to take it seriously. Because if they're not, no free coffee. Dang, look the, the, the rewards are great. And I would say also make sure that your red team is going to do something that is not precisely what's described in any existing playbook. Make enough of a, of a, of a change so that the blue team has to think about it. Um, and that, that's critical because that's where the learning happens when they really have to engage their thought rather than simply reading from a script. Yeah. My other favorite is handing the rule, the procedures manual to the red team as if it's been stolen. Very nice. <laughs> Give them the keys of the kingdom, right? Yep. Very good. Very good. We'll we did that. In, we, we actually did yeah. that in the cyber range exercise. And it was chaos for about 20 minutes. And then they recovered. It was pretty cool. Well, it sounds like these, this, this whole process is definitely, I, I definitely feel that organizations should be thinking about doing it more um, as they, as they move forward with cybersecurity readiness. And I think this is definitely a good tool for the toolbox, as you guys said, yeah. well, speaking. They're actually yeah, pretty exactly. good at team building too. Exactly. Well, speaking of interesting facts and things to learn, we have things to learn from our guests. So we definitely should get moving on that. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week at Enterprise Tech, and that's Bitwarden. Now, Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, at work, or on the go, and it's trusted by millions. Even our very own Steve Gibson has switched over. That means something. Now, with Bitwarden, all the data in your vault is end-to-end -end encrypted not just your passwords. Protect your data and privacy with Bitwarden by adding security to your passwords with strong, randomly generated passwords for each user. Go further with the username generator, create unique usernames for each account, or even use any of the five integrated email alias services. Bitwarden has new features to announce in their latest February release, including significant impacts and updates to the key derivation function encryption. The new Bitwarden accounts will use 600,000 KDF iterations for PBKDF2 as recommended by OWASP. Argon 2ID is also an optional alternative KDF for users seeking specialized protection. A stronger mastered password has a higher impact on security than KDF and iteration, so you should have a long, strong and unique master password, the best protection. They also have master password security checks. New users who create their accounts on mobile apps, browser extensions, and desktop apps can now check known data breaches for their prospective master password via HIBP. The logging in with a device is now available for additional clients. Login requests can also be initiated from browser extensions, mobile apps, and desktop apps share private data security with coworkers across departments or the entire company with fully customizable and adaptive plans bitwarden's teams organization option is just three dollars a month per user while their enterprise organization plan is just five dollars a month per user individual users can always use the basic free account for an unlimited number of passwords upgrade anytime to a premium account for less than a dollar a month or bring the whole family organization option to give up to six users premium features for only three dollars and 33 cents a month at twit we are fans of password managers bitmorn is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home on the go or at work and it's trusted by millions of individuals teams and organizations worldwide get started with a free trial of a teams or enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit that's bitwarden.com slash twit and we thank bitwarden for their support of this week in enterprise tech well folks it's my favorite part of the show we actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the twilight ride today we have vincent Cristania. he's the ceo of keegan welcome to the show Vince vincent oh hi thank you for having me absolutely now our our audience obviously is 
a complete spectrum of experiences in the IT pro and enterprise world, and they love to hear people's origin stories. Can you take us through a journey through tech and where it brought you to, Keegan? Sure, sure. Um, so I graduated in 97 uh, uh, from the Technical University of Delft in computer science. And my uh, thesis was on uh, compiler technology. Um, and, uh, I, and I wanted to see the world, so I decided that well, actually computer science was you know, a, a very useful skill at the time. So I, I, I uh, moved over to, uh, to, to England to work for a company called Arm. Uh, some of you users might be familiar with Arm, uh, but uh, in those days, uh, in 98, uh, very few people had heard of Arm. Arm is a uh, company that designs uh, microprocessors, so the, the computing heart of, uh, of most of the chips, and particularly uh, very big in, in, in mobile technology. Uh, and then with about the next 20 years, I spent an arm growing as the company went from uh, from 200 people to about you know, five, 6,000 uh, by, by the time I left. Um, it various roles uh, in both the technology side, uh, but also the uh, the leadership side, uh, the commercial side. You know, I, I like to, to just get my technology also used and understand you now uh, the, the human dimension when it comes to, to tech. Um, and then in about uh, 2016, I, I started heading up the security arm of, of ARM. And uh, Keegan was born out of common security things. We'll, I'm sure we'll talk about it in a second. Um, and uh, decided to spin off from ARM in 2020, uh, just as the pandemic uh, took off. So uh, we have now been, been running for the last uh, two, two and a half years as, a, as an independent company. It's an amazing story. Now, you moved into the, a very interesting space because I think Keegan does some pretty interesting things with IoT uh, and the concept of eSIMs and iSIMs. And we definitely want to get into that. I want to talk to a little bit about the concept of IoT, because we, we covered a lot on the show, but we covered the negative side of it. We covered the fact that, obviously, from a consumer perspective, these things are insecure, they're not updated frequently, they cause lots of problems on people's networks. From the cons from the enterprise, even from a large organization perspective, these things are on the network, they cause, you know, they cause lots of problems, they're not always updated, they're, they're, they're you know, they cause lots of security holes. What is some things that you're seeing in industry to help combat that type of uh, thing from an IoT perspective? Um, okay, so so, uh, so you want to talk about the, te uh, the technology, the security behind it? Um, just in general, just in general okay, yeah. from an IoT perspective. I know that we talk a lot about on this show, very general cases where they cause a lot of problems, but we never really understand what the solutions are for that. And I'm just curious what you're seeing in the industry. Yeah, cool. I think the key thing is now to exactly look at those problems and, and come up with a um, security design team from the start. Right. When we are looking at security, we're thinking, okay, what is the most important part of security of the, the things on your network? And you need, the key thing is to need to know what those things are. So that's what we call in the security industry, the secure identity or the lowest level of passwords. We're, not, we're just talking about passwords on that uh, Bitwarden, but every device also has like a password or a lowest level key. And you build the security up from that all the way to the end. Uh, with uh, with a you know end-to-end uh, -end, uh, certification where you, you know what the device is, you have certified it, you have done the red team, blue teaming, you have done penetration testing, all the way through the for the certification um, uh, agencies, all the way to you know, the, to the cloud where the thing gets managed. Because again, very important, uh, the the firmware updating, the um, all these things are now very important to design in from the start uh, to make sure that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. And I think that the like organizations obviously are somewhat, I would say, almost afraid to start integrating these things into their network. What are some ways to for them to start thinking about maybe even integrating this security into their process as they start to implement and onboard these things uh, into their organization? Also, um, we, we thought about it quite a long time and, and, and security is quite nebulous, right? So what is good enough security? I always compare it with a lock. Um, if you have a lock on your door, then always can someone come around and, and buy and sell, sell you a bigger lock. Because now, big bad guys out there, right? Uh, the, the bigger the lock, the better, the more security, the better. Um, and what we really, really liked when we were thinking about security was uh, the, the way that SIM is being used. Um, SIM is you know, very much trusted, right? It's a, a actually incredible uh, bit of technology that's been, been around for about 25 years. Um, and been uh, securing our mobile phones and our mobile phones secure things like nowadays you know, um, our, our social media, but also our banking app. Uh, lots of these passwords are all secured by the two-factor authentication of the SIM. So we thought, well, if you are willing to trust the SIM, right, and, and the industry is clearly, we should start building the secure technology based in those kind of technologies. And that's kind of really the, 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 the step we, to, we took is to make sure, okay, let's take that SIM and let's now initially uh, do it with IoT and cellular IoT, but over time, why, why not 
bring that uh, further and, and start rolling that kind of technology out everywhere because it's really high security. And I think that is the key thing that you start trusting it and you start understanding also uh, where it comes from. So it's interesting you bring this up because I, I think a lot of people just think that if you're integrating the SIM technology, you're sticking a SIM chip on a device and connecting it to a cellular network. And the question is, how does that make it more secure? So maybe we can tell the audience a little bit more about what what is what's going on in this part of the industry, what you guys are doing with it, and why it makes things more secure and more trusted up front. Yeah, so the SIM, SIM itself has not been uh, broken a lot. Kind of, it has been, it's been, kind of been, been attacked like, like the red team, the blue teams in the industry for, for many years and actually stood up now. Yeah, there are some, some incidents, uh, but generally stood up pretty well uh, against it. Um, the industry has done, uh, uh, no, I need to go a little further, has done a, a next step. The next step is to take the SIM and, and no longer have the hole in the side, but solder it down. Um, that is now uh, aesthetically, uh, people like Apple really like uh, the, getting rid of the hole, but from an IoT point of view, no, quite important, no more dust, no more water. Um, but when you do that, if you want to change um, uh, your, uh, your operator, you will have to do that via a software update, which is really good because now you're managing the SIM, right? You're managing this security, these updates, the, when you find the holes, uh, really important. And at the same time, also there is now end-to-end -end, uh, certification, which means that uh, every part of the, um, uh, the, uh, the security chain has to be certified and has to have certificates, which means that uh, the, the SIM can only talk to the things they trust. You cannot put uh, man in the middle attacks and, and all these other things. So it's taking the SIM, it's uh, now making it broader, uh, putting some of the cyber security techniques in those small devices, um, while at the same time also being really hardened against security attacks by having that now the, uh, the, 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 the penetration testing, which we, we'll take a, you know, effectively a red team and say, here is a, is a device, Please go and attack it any way you want, right? And and then learn from that. And then the device has to withstand you know, uh, two weeks of attack uh, without uh, without it giving in. So that you know that you now if this is a certain a certain value, that uh, it would take someone at least two weeks to uh, get into this device. A lot of organizations they're starting to think about failover backbones being in you know cellular technologies this is something that is is definitely a recommended approach obviously because of just the fact that it's could potentially be more secure than some of the other kind of background ways of managing you know failover of networks and other trunks of networks do you think that this is really a, a good way of doing it um and and do you do you guys have some similar technology that type of thing yeah i think um uh doesn't no, limit it to cellular, but I think that's where it starts. Cellular is, is a really heavily defended technology. Uh, there are very big companies that 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 work on making sure that your mobile phone, your data is also very secure. Um, but you can build from that, right? So that those techniques can start flowing into uh, other spaces. Uh, again, for instance, if you are you know, uh, a bit of a hobbyist, uh, you, you start bringing in some more professional equipment uh, like the, your, your routers and your, um, uh, your switches into your own house. Um, most of those start with you know, having to adopt devices into your house, having to ad adopt new parts of technology. And you can see that's really you now a good way of doing it. You kind of you know what the um, the new um, uh, device is. It can be an access point or you know, a camera. Uh, you have to adopt it, so you are very much in control. You know exactly where these things come from. Uh, the more you build these networks, the more important that becomes. And I think some of that came from the uh, the cellular technology. Some of that is already in the network uh, space and and, uh, and and is just being rolled out wider. And I think that's you now um, that takes away some of the, the fundamental the laziness, if you will. I think you now, or, or or maybe not really thinking through some of the IT devices now. It's just awful, right? Um, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we have we have gone past the you know, default passwords of five zeros. <laughs> you can still, right. yeah, exactly. You can still hear it, and 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 yeah, most yeah, professional IT equipment doesn't use that, right? They they use the the, the secure identity. They and again, we need to roll it out to everything what we are trying to connect to the to the internet and everything we're trying to connect to the IT cloud. So you obviously brought out the fact that this this type of technology seems to be implemented more and more um, in different devices and, and and types of networks. Now, why do you think that more products aren't using this type of you know, SIM implemented security. Um, is it is just the cost of implementing or integrating it? Um, I think you know, initially it's, it's a bit pigeonholed on the cellular uh, technology, which uh, which is really good for 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 many different IoT applications, right? Uh, that if you want uh, want to just work, uh, then that's that's really useful. But um, I think cellular today, if you have a full cellular modem, it's probably uh, quite uh, power hungry and uh, expensive. Right? Those are the, the two things. So if you at some point want to go to you know, um, uh, lower cost or um, uh, lower energy uses like Bluetooth or something like that, 
or, or Wi-Fi, then uh, today not all those technologies have SIM-like technologies built into that. But that doesn't, doesn't mean that we can't go there uh, no, uh, from now to, until the future. We are we're working really hard on creating uh, applications that are not just in cellular space, but also in any connectivity space, where, where, you, where you take the, the SIM as a secure element, if you will, in the corner of your device. Uh, it does your, your network management, but it also does uh, no, signing of data coming off the device. Uh, it's again rooted in this really strong technology um, of uh, security uh, and the data coming over the device can then be identified as this data came from this device. I know this device, it's a secure device, it hasn't been hacked, it has been updated, it has been all these things you can you can then check in the data and, and, and you design it in from the start. Now, I, I do want to bring my co-hosts back in um, because they are definitely itching to ask some questions here. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week, Enterprise Tech, and that's Zip Recruiter. Now, did you know that it can take up to 11 weeks on average to hire for an open position? I know it's it's challenging out there, even in the current market. Now, that's almost two and a half months. So if you're hiring for a growing business, you could be asking yourself and you should be asking yourself, do I have to wait that long? Well, if you're listening today, I've got some advice for you. Stop waiting. Start using ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter can help you find qualified candidates for all your roles fast. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Twiat. Now, how is ZipRecruiter so efficient at helping you hire? Well, ZipRecruiter uses powerful matching technology to help quickly find and send you the most qualified people for your role. Now, you can check out the people that ZipRecruiter sends you. And if you really like one or two, you can personally invite them to apply with just one click which can make them apply even faster and even sooner plus here's how quickly zip recruiter can work to help you hire four out of five employers who post on zip recruiter get a qualified candidate within the first day so speed up your hiring process with zip recruiter see why 3.3 million businesses have come to zip recruiter for their hiring needs just go to their exclusive web address to try zip recruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash Twiat. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash T-W-I-E-T. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. And we thank ZipRecruiter for the support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Vincent Cristanier, the CEO of Keegan. We talk about IoT security and the eSIM and iSIM technologies. Now, I do want to bring my co-host back in because this is definitely a very interesting topic. And so they have some experience here. Now, Brian, I want to bring you in first because I know you have some questions. Well, my my big question is more asking your opinion. So just before I retired from the University of Hawaii, I, I was talking and starting to roll out some new devices based on LTE Cat M. And during that presentation from my cellular rep, um, I actually had a custom APN so I could isolate my IoT devices. Um, we started getting hints of what was to come in the 5G world. So here's my question. My question is low power devices and low bandwidth, but um, short latency devices like LTE, Cat M, and so forth, and the newer um, low bandwidth channels within the 5G world. Do you think that's going to make a huge change? in the way we gather data about things like shipments, um, perishables, and so forth. And why has the eSIM and iSIM made that big a difference in adopting uh, these low bandwidth IoT solutions? Yes, absolutely. Uh, no, that's exactly the thing, this thing that uh, I'm getting very excited about. Uh, am I allowed to show you an impromptu little, um, little prototype? Uh, this is about two years old. Um, this is a, a label, and uh, the label is uh, is done by uh, by Bayer was Bayer Labs, uh, and a big uh, yeah big uh, pharmaceutical, um, and it's completely printed plastic. Um, it, the battery is plastic. Uh, the antennas are plastic. Uh, it's narrowband IoT, so it's it's five G low 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 bandwidth. And the thing is effectively only just saying I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, and, and can hooked up to some sen sensor sensors. Um, you can see that. Now this is kind of uh, has one chip on it, which, which has an iSIM, there's an integrated SIM and a, and a cellular uh, narrowband IoT modem. And it can effectively start tracking things like, for instance, um, uh, vaccines or uh, pharmaceutical uh, products. Because in the US it's now mandatory to follow that from, from 
manufacturing all the way to uh, to uh, to consumer. And how do you do that? How do you do it around the world, right? And that's not Wi-Fi clearly can't scale. So you need to think about you now um, what kind of cellular technology. We also have a company we're working with is a company called Skylo. Uh, they they effectively uh, repurpose uh, satellite um, uh, TV satellites to then also do uh, narrowband I I IoT. So you can think for, of a product that leaves, for instance, uh, India, uh, gets produced there, uh, it, uh, it, it leaves the network there, it roams onto the satellite completely seamlessly, then ends up in San Francisco Harbor and all that gets tracked. Now, these are pallets, you know, and, and that is going to be millions and millions and millions of them. So I think uh, this is going to be a huge takeoff in the, in the next few, um, oh, excellent, yes, <laughs> in the next few um, years. It's uh, absolutely, to me, we've been talking about IoT for a long time, and we, we do have cool products, but I think to me, it's really brimming on this edge now with that, uh, that low power uh, radio, which allows you to, uh, to very easily connect around the world. Well, here, here's, let's take that line of, thought a little further. Um, I would call it 15 years ago. That, that's how long this has been thought about. The Food and Drug Administration in the United States had a, ver a lot of worry about food spoilage. And they started throwing out requests for proposals on how we can go and not only track food shipments, but also get some sensors in there for also, you know, perishables. Has the technology in the iSIM gone far enough that we can actually integrate in things like temperature sensors so that we know that the milk hasn't gone bad? Yeah, absolutely. So again, that goes back to that prototype I just showed on, of that, 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 um, uh, that tracker. That tracker can be connected to, to different uh, sensors. So if you, at the moment, that tracker is probably a bit more for high end. Uh, so think about the vaccines. Vaccines need to be cooled to minus uh, no, uh, 40, 40 Fahrenheit or whatever um, when they can transport it. But you can have a temperature sensor. You can have a uh, positional uh, GPS. You can see where the where the crate has been. You can see what uh, the, um, the the temperature is. Has it been within uh, the right space? Now today, uh, I think um, if you look at cellular tracking, you probably you know for the modem itself, looking you know, at, at a ten dollar kind of product. Clearly, if you want to go to all the way to um, to tracking uh, food and uh, at, a, at a quite granular le level, we'll have to work as an industry harder to, to get those prices down. Uh, but again, as the volume go up, the price will come down. So you know, I'm a great believer that this will really help in in every kind of situation. Okay, my last question. <clears throat> I big 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 fan of the raspberry pi and the arm processor and all the electronics behind that and so forth has made a huge difference in the uh, number of people involved with developing iot solutions um but here's 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 the question i have and how it pertains to you is lte well actually cellular technology in general has been difficult to implement um, certificates. I, we know that quite a few cellular um, technologies, we all read about the 2004, I think it was 2004 G pack that was published in wired magazine. And that was because the implementers of the infotainment system on the Jeep didn't even use a private APN. And there was, problems on the back end they they were able to talk from modem to modem uh and that's how the bad guys got in and hacked the um jeep so is gigan working with the implementers to try and close up these holes to you know hammer in the best practices on working with isims and esims and to close up these holes that have appeared in publications um so, so some of these uh, holes are a bit more towards the uh, the, the mobile network operators. Um, clearly, they are very closely involved in the setting the standards of of security, which uh, SIM is the the cornerstone in my eyes of that uh, that uh, security standard. Um, the other thing as well is today, I think the networks are not quite used to having you know, uh, a thousand different devices on it. So, so getting onto a network uh, is, is is a bit of a challenge. Um, but then we have, uh, I'm sure you're aware of this, uh, companies like uh, Murata, the, mo the module makers that effectively make little um, cellular subboards for your ra Raspberry Pi, or cellular daughter boards for your Raspberry Pi that allow you to uh, to create you know, a, a modem connection 
uh, and they are working very very hard with all the um, the MNOs to uh, you know, open their eyes and, and pre-qualify some of these boards and set them up correctly uh, and making sure that this is now done in a in a very thorough way. Uh, so I think the industry is working on that. Is it all solved? No, uh, I think it's it is just the explosion that is coming. I don't think everybody is completely ready for, and and, and it will be you know, a learning journey as well. But I think that the industry is putting really hard together to actually make that happen and 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 remove some of those you know silly mistakes uh, by having it pre-validated, uh, pre-approved, uh, um, ready to go, if you will. Well, maybe the last question really needs to be: Is the industry starting to get used to the concept of? short connections, bursty, bursty connections, traditional modems, you keep the connection up and then you keep going, you transmit, you transmit, and then you break it. Um, burst transmissions or bursty transmissions, we can just have an always on network and just toss out a piece of data. But I haven't seen a lot of these kinds of implementations in the toolkits. Um, is this something that we might be able to see from Keegan in the near future? Better um, toolkits for this stuff? That's, that's a little bit beyond us. It's more of our partners that are working on the on the radio, so so and the and the radio protocols. Uh, so we are you know, very strongly specialized in the security behind it. Uh, so we we provide those components uh, to the the, uh, the people that put the, the the modules together um, uh, and who put the radios together. So so no, I'm I'm not an expert in that. So I'm afraid. Uh, I do know that the CAT M modems and the narrowband IT modems are much more designed for that uh, that short communication, that few bytes you know, per month, if you will, instead of the few a few bytes per, per millisecond or the few megabytes per millisecond. So, so these new modems uh, and the new radios are you know, much more designed for that kind of use case. But uh, again, the, the detail there is I, I, I would have to, uh, to pass, I'm afraid. Um. My colleague Brian has, has asked some great questions. I, I want to look at something when it comes to, to IoT, and we're, we're really focusing a lot on IoT in our conversation with you today. One of the great issues that people have focused on in the U.S. is the fact that so many IoT devices cannot be updated, cannot be improved when new security technology comes about. Is what you're doing one of the potential answers to that because of the remote provisioning ability so that through the eSIM, through trust that's enabled by the eSIM, there are ways to continually update the trust relationship of those IoT devices? Yeah, yes, correct. So that's actually the, the big step in from, from a SIM to an eSIM. When you solder the, uh, the SIM down, you must have something that can update it. Because otherwise you cannot uh, now change from operators. You, you cannot uh, uh, kind of, uh, so you have to have a secure server. And that's trust relationship between the, uh, the, the element, which is the, the eSIM for the security, and the, the server that updates that is an, a mandatory part of it, which is really important when it comes now. I don't have to tell you, because clearly uh, you are very well aware of this, but it's a really important thing that that, that, that part is there. If, even if you can't update the rest of the system, you can at least update that part, and that means that you can at least disable the system if, you know, if the rest of the system wasn't, uh, wasn't good, and you will always be able to, to control your system and say, okay, this one is, you know, is uh, for instance, we found a, a bug we can't fix, you can still uh, then then have that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, trust switch where you can switch the device off if necessary. Very good. Now, I'm also interested. I, th I think our listeners would be interested to know when you're talking about you know we we've been discussing trust in in all of its various permutations. Are you providing a a spot solution? In other words, the eSIM or with your continued relationship to that eSIM, if it exists, are you becoming an ongoing part of the implementer's supply chain? You know, are, are you becoming really a, a, an integral part of their operational supply chain, or are you providing these components so that they then have responsibility for all the deployment and all the updating and 
all of the things required to continue that trust relationship? Um, so, so yes, I think it's the, uh, the, the, the easy answer. It's a little bit more, um, uh, more, 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 uh, uh, more involved, but, uh, generally what we su supply is both the software for the, for the eSIM itself, which is the eSIM has an OS, uh, we provide the software and with our partners, uh, you can then create an eSIM. Um, the iSIM is when it actually now becomes part of, for instance, the modem, uh, so the, the, the radio chip, the radio chip itself can also have a SIM built in and uh, becomes an iSIM, which means you can remove one of the chips. Again, we provide the software. And then we also have a server where we uh, uh, connect to this eSIM and iSIM and, and keep it updated. And that server then integrates with uh, the uh, mobile network operator, the, the MNO, the MVNO, um, to make sure that, that they can then uh, talk to our server, which is super secure and highly defend defended. Um, and that keeps that uh, that eSIM kind of up to date and keeps it you know, uh, making sure that 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 is uh, a talking to the right the right network, but b also has the latest security uh, patches. This is really super interesting stuff into here. Unfortunately, time flies when you're having fun. You learn some new stuff here, but I did want to take some time to maybe give you a, a chance to tell the folks at home where they can learn more about Keegan and maybe how organizations can get started if they're thinking about integrating with IoT. Yeah, so uh, we work across the industry. Um, the module maker would be the, the first start you will, you'll see us. Uh, if you want to know more about us, uh, come and talk to us at keegan.com. And uh, we're always uh, willing to answer questions. Reach out to me, myself as well. I'm on LinkedIn. I always love to talk technology and, uh, and come and talk to us, ask us questions. Um, you'll see us with both the module makers and the, uh, the MNOs and, and be you know, powering behind that. Um, and, and, and know that we're all working really hard to make it you know, safe by default and safe and designed in. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. It was a great talk, chat. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat there another hour of the best dang enterprise and IT podcast in the universe. So definitely tune your podcatcher to Twyat. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my amazing co-host, starting the very own Mr. Brian G. Chebert. What's going on for you in the coming week? Where can people find you? Uh, Juan, I think I'm going to be spending some time on the Keegan.com website and learning more about these iSIMs. Um, so far, a lot of the IOT devices I've been working with have been primitive and I've been wanting other things. So yeah, I'm going to start reading up on that. The other cool thing is, um, I love tinkering and a lot of viewers have hit me with all kinds of interesting questions. I'm more than happy to field them on Twitter. I am ADV N E T L A B advanced net lab. And I uh, would love to hear from you. You're also more than welcome to throw questions, show, show suggestions, and so forth um, to Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T at twit.tv. Or you could send it to twyatt at twit.tv, and that'll hit all the hosts. We'd love to hear your uh, comments. We'd love to hear your questions. And we'd love for you to be safe. And Adam the Phantop, yes. Your, mo your mom is in our prayers. Hopefully she'll be fine, but um, your th our thoughts are with you. Thanks, Chibri. Well, I also want to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what about you? What's coming up for you the coming weeks? Where can people find you and all your work? Well, uh, people can find me. The subscribers to Omdia's uh, reports can find a major report that's coming out for me uh, this week. Um, I'll also be doing some things on dark reading and on LinkedIn, where I'm going to be talking about some of the things I saw at the two, uh, industry conferences I attended last week, uh, going to be getting ready for RSA. Uh, so if any members of the Twyatt Riot are going to be there, drop me a note. Uh, I'd love to have a chance to see you face to face. You can always keep up with where I, what I'm doing on Twitter. I'm at KG4GWA. I'm on Mastodon, KG4GWA, at SDF. Um, I'm sorry, mastodon.sdf.org. Uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn, Curtis Franklin, and uh, oh, lots of other places. So feel free to drop me a note at any of those. Love to hear from members of the Twyatt Riot and to see you when we can uh, be in the same place, breathing the same air, uh, as is becoming more and more common in these post plague years. 
Indeed it is. Indeed it is. Well, thank you, Curtis, for being here. Well, well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch it, to listen to our show and get our enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch and listen and catch up on your enterprise and IT news. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of the amazing back episodes, the co-host information, the guest information, all the notes, of course, the links of the stories that we do during the show. But more importantly, there next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links go ahead and get the show in your audio version or video version of your choice listen on any one of your devices because we're on all the podcast applications so definitely subscribe and support the show plus you may have also heard we also have club to it that's a great way to support the show as well it's a members only ad free podcast service and they also have a bonus twit plus feed that you can't get anywhere else it's only seven dollars a month and the great thing about twit is it comes with a lot of features in fact it not only comes with a members only discord channel but it also comes with that twit plus feed and also some special events there's a lot you can have discussions with chat with hosts you can producers you can have <clears throat> side discussions all the amazing channels that are out there lots of fun stuff so definitely join the fun be part of the movement join club twit at twit.tv slash club twit now club twit also offers corporate group plans as well that's right it's a great way to give access to your entire team and give them access to our ad free tech podcasts to all of them and the plans start with five members at discounted rate of six dollars each per month and you can add as many seats as you like and this is really a great way for your it departments your sales departments your developers your tech teams to really stay on top and up to date to access to all of our podcasts and just like regular members they can also join the twit discord server and the twit plus bonus feed as well so go to twit.tv slash club twit now after you subscribe you can impress your friends your family members your co-workers with the gift of twiet because we we talk about a lot of fun tech topics on this show and i guarantee they will find it fun and interesting and enjoyable as well so definitely and share that show with them as well now if you have already subscribed you and you're available 1 30 p.m fridays that's right right now we do this show live at live.twit.tv go there right now there are all the streams you can choose from you can come see how the pizza's made all the behind the scenes all the fun banter we do before and after the show definitely join the live stream and be part of that fun if you're going to join the live stream you might as well join our live chat room as well we also have a live chat room that's going on right now at irc.twit.tv you can join all the amazing characters in there they give us some great topics show topics uh show titles they're, they're really great characters in there so definitely join that that crew and be part of that motley crew and also watch the show live now i want you to hit me up whether it's on twitter linkedin uh mass and wherever you want to go um twitter.com slash luamam if you want to hit me up there um, you could also hit me up at luamam at twit that social and of course i'm also on linkedin as well i i love hearing your show ideas questions about the industry comments that kind of thing so definitely hit me up as much as you can on all those platforms and and, and i want to have a great discussion so definitely do that if you want to know I, what i do at my at microsoft during the, my normal work week don't go to developers.microsoft.com slash office. There we post all the latest and greatest ways for you to customize your office experience. There it is. And of course, also pay attention when you open Excel the next time, because if you have Microsoft 365 and you open Excel, check out that automate tab. That's right. That new automate tab. That's right there. That's my bread and butter. That's what we're working on. That allows you to create macros across all of your app, client applications, all the platforms, whether it's web or desktop, and you can run them in the cloud. You can run them on Power Automate. A lot of cool stuff. So definitely check that out the next time you're in Excel. I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support This Week in Enterprise Tech each and every week. We couldn't do the show without them. So thank you for all their support over the years. Of course, thank you to all the staff and engineers at Twit. I also want to thank Mr. Brian Chi one more time. He's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer. He does all the show bookings and the plans for the show. And I can definitely tell you we couldn't do the show without him. Thank you, Chibert, for all your support. And, of course, before we sign out, we also have to thank our editor for today because they make us look good after the fact. So thank you for making us look good, cutting out all my mistakes. I appreciate that. And of course, I also have to thank Mr. Ant Pruitt because he's our TD for today. But also, he's a pretty talented uh, photographer, and he has a great show called Hands-On Photography, which this week is pretty compelling. He talks a little bit about privacy when it comes to photography, right, Aaron? What, what's going on there? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Lou. Yeah, we had to talk about privacy. I mean, you know, this is an enterprise tech show and this is twit.tv. So we're going to be all about data privacy, but we tend to forget that privacy should be of a concern as photographers. So 
I want to touch on some lawsuits that are kicked that kicked off here recently and um, tell people that are photographers, first off, don't be jerks with your cameras and also know that you do have rights. Twit.tv slash H-O-P is where you can watch the show. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ann. Well, until next time, I'm Louis Baresca, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hey, we should talk Linux. It's the operating system that runs the internet, a bunch of game consoles, cell phones, and maybe even the machine on your desk. But you already knew all that. What you may not know is that Twit now has a show dedicated to it, the Untitled Linux Show. Whether you're a Linux pro, a burgeoning sysadmin, or just curious what the big deal is, you should join us on the Club Twit Discord every Saturday afternoon for news, analysis, and tips to sharpen your Linux skills. And then make sure you subscribe to the Club Twit exclusive Untitled Linux Show. Wait, you're not a Club Twit member yet? Well, go to twit.tv slash club twit and sign up. Hope to see you there. Twitter.